Well, if you're a regular attender of uh, Open Door, you'll have not noticed the series that we're sort of <laughs> hopping around on. Um, but two weeks ago, Anna led us as an intergenerational service, um, very much around us as a church being family with all the different sort of meanings of that word family, um, how we need each other, how we support and care for one another as family. Um, then last week we looked at 1 Corinthians 12 and we looked at the church being the body of Christ, each part designed differently, each has a different purpose, each is used at different times, some bits are more obvious than others yet they all need to work together. And we looked particularly um, at Sunday mornings around that. Today, we're going to be looking at part of the story of Gideon um, from the book of Judges. I happen to have been reading the book of Judges this week. It's not my favorite book in the Bible. There's some pretty grim times in it. And the book of Judges can be summarized by this <coughs> phrase. Judges comes after Joshua has taken the land of Israel and the Israelites are beginning to um, settle in the land. Joshua dies and uh, various judges are raised up by God. But the book is summarized by these words. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. And we're going to read together the first 10 verses of Judges chapter 6. <laughs> he says with great confidence. Hey. Right. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites, because the power of the Midian was so oppressive the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the other East eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel. Neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys, they came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you've not listened to me. Israel's situation, everyone did as they pleased and consequently they were ruled over by people called the Midianites. They stole their crops, their animals, they were impoverishing the Israelites. There was nothing that they could do. They couldn't overpower them in their own strength. And they cried to God for help. just not my day today. <laughs> now it's gone completely. Ah. God's response was interesting in this case because he sent a prophet and you expected the prophet to solve the situation. You expected the prophet to come up with the answer but all he told them was, your fault. Look at all the stuff I've done for you. I brought you out of Egypt. I've brought you 40 years through the desert. 
broken in my hand now. <laughs> I've provided a land flowing with milk and honey. I've done all of this. But you've not lost, listened to me. And then all we, all we really know is, presumably, the prophet went home again. He just left them. Explained to them the situation. And the cause of the trouble was there was no one to stand up. There was no one who was saying to the Israelites, turn back to God. He is our Lord. He has given us the way to live and we are not follow him, following him. There was no one standing up against the popular, popular culture of what was in Israel at the time. Consequently, they were being overrun by the Midians. And when you look at the church situation in the UK today, there are some very good stories of what is happening. There are people being saved. There are some miraculous healings. There is a sense of, of God being at least among his people. But our effectiveness, I would argue, is limited. We are seeing our nation move further and further and further away from God's, I would say, vision and goal for our nation. And there are very few in the church who are standing up against popular culture. There are some. And they're paying quite a price for it. But God is gracious. He's told the Israelites, look, I've done all this for you, but you've not been obedient to me. Therefore, you've become weak, ineffective, and crushed. But then he sends his angel. And to us as a church, he would say, as he says in 1 Timothy 2.4, he wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Israel's situation was that they were overrun. Our church is similar. Not our church, the church. Ian Hames brought a word to us a few weeks ago about reassessing our lives in the light of the glorious good news of Jesus. It's interesting what Leah said about death. It was an outrage. Death being an outrage. I don't know how you felt when she said that. Did you just, did we just think, yeah, it's an outrage, but it's, it's what happens. But death covers a much broader spectrum than just the death of our lives, the end of our life. There's death that works in us through the things that we think, we say. There's death that can come, apart, come about in our relationships with people. There's death that can come about in the way that we live because we move aside from God's values in our lives. But God is gracious to us. He wants to bring life to us and he wants to bring more life to us. So we'll carry on with the story I'm pressing every button. <laughs> Judges 6, 11 to 16. So the prophet has just told them, you have not listened to me. 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak of Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Azabarite where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press 
to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. So who was Gideon? Well, God saw Gideon as a mighty warrior. I often, uh, when I think of this story, you've got Gideon down in a wine press, hiding away, and he's threshing out the wheat. And then I often picture the angel coming and sort of sitting there on the tree, watching Gideon and thinking, I know the message I've got to bring to Gideon, but am I in the wrong place? <laughs> wrong guy? But this is the message? God says, you, Gideon, are a mighty warrior. God saw who he was and what he was, could accomplish. He saw that here was a chosen child of the people of God. He saw that he could be a mighty warrior in the future. And so he sent the angel to say to him, you are a mighty warrior. That was God's view of Gideon. What was Gideon's view of his situation and of himself. Gideon's view of the situation is, hang on a minute, God. We're oppressed. We're impoverished. We're hungry. And where have all the wonders gone? Where have all the miracles gone? Where's all the stories of your provision every day of food? Where's the, sto where's the miracles of crossing the Jordan? Where's the miracles of crossing the Red Sea? Where's the punishment you inflicted on the Egyptians? Where are you, God? What are you doing? We seem so barren, so powerless. This is our situation, God. Why have you abandoned us? Now the prophet has already told him why, but somehow he's not comprehended it. That's Gideon's view of his situation. There is no hope, there's no way out of this. We're trapped. And what about Gideon's view of himself? Mighty warrior? You want me to go and save the people of Israel? You want me to go and reclaim the land? God, my clan is the weakest and the smallest. We have no power. We have no influence. What can we do as a clan? And not only that, I am the least in my family. Now, as you read through the Bible, you find that the least in the families do quite a lot. Samuel was just a little but kid. David was ignored. Some of the great prophets, well, actually, I'm just a shepherd, but God has given me this message. And you'll find through the Bible that those who are least 
often achieve the most. So Gideon's view of himself is what can I do about it? But God says, he says this to Gideon first, go in your strength. Go in your strength. And Gideon's like, I haven't got any. I have no power, no position, no strength. Look at me, I'm down in a wine press beating out the wheat. What am I? And I think he did that so that Gideon would reflect once more on his own weakness. Remember the other week? We have this treasure in earthen jars. Gideon was profoundly aware of his weakness. But God says this, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. God's answer is, yes, Gideon, I'm not going to argue with you. You're in the smallest clan, the weakest clan, and you are the least of them. But I will be with you. I will be with you. And if God is for us, if God is for us, who, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the who is God with? Us, and unusually, let's individualize it. Me. Gideon had only one real power, and that was God was with him. So what of us? We've been speaking recently about our purpose being a church. Bill Hybels writes this. Next slide, Dougie. Mine's given up. Oh, it's not Dougie. <laughs> Mine's given up. Nothing on earth has greater potential to change lives and carry out his kingdom work than the local church. There is nothing like the local church when it is working right. Its beauty is indescribable. Its power is breathtaking. Its potential unlimited. No other organization on earth is like the church. Nothing comes close. It's a guy called Bill Hybels. Unfortunately, he couldn't quite live up to his own standards, but that doesn't do away with the quote. Our nation needs God. Northamptonshire needs God. And we may be the smallest, we may be the least, we may, they may be the most powerful. But God is with us. God is with us. Ephesians 3.10 says, God's intent was that through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. God has great plans for his church on the earth. Over the last few years, there has been some amazingly saddening failures in the church. Many of them often getting in the papers. 
And part of that has been God purifying his church. Part of it is God showing our weakness as a people. And there are two, only two ways we can really respond to it. It's just to shut up shop and say, okay, well, we're all right. We'll have nice little time on a Sunday. We'll feel the presence of God. Or we recognize the weakness and the failures. And we say, but God is with us and leading us. We are going to alter our lives so that we are pure and holy people of God. The first thing that Gideon has to do is to go down and pull an idol in his village. Um, the village idol, he has to go and destroy it and burn it and smash it. But he doesn't do it on his own. He gets ten servants with him and says, come and help me do this. A little bit later, he'll gather an army. I think it's 32,000 or something. And God will say, that's too many. Go down to 300. And there's 300 that will destroy the Midianite army. But as those 300 do their work, a few hours later, um, Gideon calls a whole load of others to come and do their part in winning the victory. The church is the body of Christ. And as we heard last week, we are all necessary. We all have a part to play. It may be a different part. It may be a part that is used a lot, maybe part that's used a little. It may be a part that is obvious. It may be a part that is unseen. But all of us working together are part of the body of Christ. And we're that in our works, in our shop, when we go shopping, in our leisure time, in our families and our homes. Wherever we are, we are the church together. Gideon understood his weakness, but he then went and moved in the power of God. We, the people, are the body of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2.9 says this, as I think we might have read this earlier. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. God wants in our day a church rising in this land that demonstrates to all the powers in heaven and earth that he is king. We can choose to be part of that. We can choose to sit on the side We have, we have a 6.30 in the morning prayer meeting on a Tuesday. And <clears throat> I, ch I chose that time deliberately because it's a really inconvenient time. <laughs> For some of you, it'll be inconvenient because you've got loads of kids running around. It's inconvenient because you might be at work by then. But probably for the vast majority of us, it's inconvenient because it's a pain to get up. <laughs> and I chose it deliberately because I knew it would be a sacrifice for me and I knew it would be a sacrifice for most of us. But I think one of the things that God wants to build into us is just a bit more sacrifice. God has made us these new people in God through his son's sacrifice.
and we are to be those who live a sacrificial life. When you read the rest of the story of Gideon, you find that God asks him um, immediately after this, you know, go and beat the Midianites. Well, okay, God, but can I just check this out? Can you just give me this sign? Oh, that worked. Can you give me this sign? Oh, that worked. Now I've got to do it. And he knew it was going to cause him problems. But we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that we may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. Once we had not, we've not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. God wants us to know our weakness and our strength. Gideon knew his weakness. He had to learn his strength in God. Many of us know our weakness. We know a little of our weakness. We know a little of God's strength. We probably need to learn a little bit more of our weakness so that we can know more of God's strength. So that we grow in his strength. Because our calling is to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Ephesians 1, 17 to 21 is a prayer of Paul. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. It's interesting that he prays for wisdom and revelation so that we might know God better. I don't know about you, but sometimes I think I need wisdom and revelation to know other people better. Because <laughs> they're different from me. They don't laugh at the jokes that I laugh at. They understand concepts that I cannot comprehend. They use words that I don't understand. They like things which I cannot understand why they would like them. Because I don't. But Paul prays that we would have wisdom and revelation to know God better. And I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. This, is Paul, this was Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus. And it's one that we can pray for each other very often. That we might know the power that we have, the same as the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. That is the power that we have. Gideon lived at a time where Israel had walked away from God. And so they were oppressed. He had to learn of his weakness so that he could walk in the power of God and restore the rule of God in his nation. We want to be a church that is restoring the gospel of Jesus in our nations. We want to see the gospel flourishing in the UK. We want to see it flourishing in South America. We want it flourishing in West Africa. We want to see it flourishing in the Middle East. 
But to do that, we have to know his power in us to a far greater extent than I would argue we see now because we're not seeing the gospel flourish in our land in the UK. We're seeing it flourish a bit in, the, in, in, in South America, a little bit in West Africa. But the job is vast. And we can't do it just by staying as we are because what we are is not accomplishing it yet. <coughs> Shared the other day, Andy's given us two words recently. One about the reservoir being full and now is the time to open the door. About us coming into a period of time of seeing some exceptional miracles, of seeing some growth. We've begun to pray more on our Sunday mornings for things. And we've seen, not a lot yet, in fact, I suspect from what I know is going on in everyone's life, in people's lives, and what's going on in my own life, what we've actually found is it's got a little bit harder and a little bit tougher, and there's been a few more difficulties and a few more challenges. And it's like we've said, God, we want to step forward. And someone's noticed and said, I don't want you stepping forward. I don't want you throwing out old stuff and getting new stuff in. And the only way through this is together and keep going to press on and to win. God is on our side. He took Gideon of the least the least powerful and the youngest. I'll leave you to read the end of the story. But the end of the story, the Midians are absolutely crushed because he walked through the challenges and the battles with his God. This is what we want, isn't it? This is what we want. Let's stand. Father, we are your people. We're your children. And as we look across our various nations, we cry out to you, come Lord Jesus. We ask for here an open door that you would continue to challenge and to provoke us to stir us, to ponder your word, to hear your voice, to walk in your spirit, that we might be those who see your glory once again on earth. Come, Lord Jesus. We ask you that you will give us courage, encouragement, and perseverance to be your people that bring your words and your voice, which leads to transformation of our lands. Come, Lord Jesus. We feel weak. We feel vulnerable. We feel often confused. But within us, God, is your power and your plans and your purposes, and your strength. God, send us out with your favor and your strength resting upon us 
as we go about our life this week. In the name of Jesus. Amen.